Hi, I'm Nico. Welcome back to the channel. Uh, sorry, it's been a while since my last video. I had a little accident uh, early in the summer. I was never in any danger, but my face took a pretty bad beating and uh, I wasn't comfortable being on camera uh, for a while. But I'm back now uh, and I'm back with this exciting new toy. It is the Horseman SW612. It is a 6x12 panorama camera that shoots 120 film. Let's get into it. So about this Horseman camera, you can see that it's basically the camera is just a metal rectangle about one inch in depth. And uh, you connect a 6x12 roll film back to the back of it. And to the front of it, you connect a large format view camera lens. Um, the lens will be mounted on a cone that lets it sit at the right distance from the film, depending on the focal length. And the cone will also have a focus ring, a helicoid, so that you can adjust your focus. Uh, so my particular lens is a um, Rodenstock 65mm f4.5. Um, it's equivalent in width to a 21mm, which is a focal length I also use on the Leica and that I love. Uh, the difference here, of course, is that in image height, it's equivalent to a 35 millimeter. So very wide, but not kind, not that wide angle of view in the height, which is why it's a panoramic a camera. Um, the specific lens sits uh, 65 millimeters away from the film plane because that's the focal length. And that means that because of inverse square law, the corners of your image are uh, much further away from the lens than the center. If, um, if this is my film and my lens sits here, you can see that this distance here is much smaller than that distance. And because of inverse square law, that size difference uh, translates to a big light difference. So to uh, get um, the best out of this lens, uh, Rodenstock uh, makes um, what we call a center filter. And it's basically a filter that darkens the middle of the picture to make sure that the center of the frame and the edges get the same amount of light. Um, in the case of the filter for this lens, you lose a stop and a half. So this is a f4.5 lens that suddenly turns into an f8 lens. Uh, this is important for your choice of film because this is really, uh, to me, a walk-around camera. You can see that it's built uh, to handle a lot, like a, a rangefinder with its uh, viewfinder on top. And if you have the luxury of being able to use a tripod for all your shots, then you really want to be using a 4x5 camera instead either with a 612 back or by cropping your sheet film because then you'll have the benefit of precise focusing and precise framing on the ground glass and uh, movements whereas with this camera you have to frame through this viewfinder so your framing is rather approximative you have to focus uh, via uh, distance uh, markings on the lens there's no confirmation that you're actually in focus and you have to close down and um, use depth of field to compensate for any uh, imprecision in focusing. Furthermore, there are of course no movements on this camera. So I think it really makes sense if you want to handhold it. If you are planning to always use a tripod, you can just stop watching this video now and go get a 4x5 view camera instead. But if you're still here and you're interested in life's greatest adventure, which is hand-holding a very high definition 6x12 camera, buckle up and let's look at some pictures. So on this first shot, you can see that uh, the lens renders really nicely. Uh, this is shot with a red filter. So the contrast is uh, a bit high, but that's to be expected. What you should notice is uh, the vignetting. This is shot with, uh, without the compensating center filter. And you can see that uh, the corners are uh, really darker than the center. It's very obvious if you look at the clouds. Um, here I painted some levels red to help you see it. 
So here's a nice color photograph from uh, Lofoten, which is uh, an archipelago uh, in the north of Norway, uh, higher than the Arctic Circle. And it's uh, very well known um, among landscape photographers and this spot called Saklisse is very well known and very photographed. Um, but you can see to me this is where uh, 6x12 format makes a lot of sense because the human eye, uh, at least among everyone who knows how to read and is used to reading and looking at screens all day, uh, we are very uh, trained to receive our information horizontally and usually from left to right. So the panorama format, by kind of eliminating the vertical uh, way of reading the picture, um, is uh, really easy on the eye and it makes things, things easier for your uh, audience. So look at the storytelling in this picture. I've, and also I think that because the 6x12 format is a double square, it's two 6x6 squares side by side, uh, I'm really happy when in a composition I can find a way to really make two pictures in one. If you imagine the, um, the gutter of a magazine in the middle, and do you have a story on the left of it and do you have a story on the right of it? For this picture, you see on the left of it, it's a picture of a floating village uh, somewhere in the north. You have the mountains, you have the sea, you have the clouds. It wouldn't win any award as it is, but it is readable and it is telling one half of the story. And then of course on the right side, you have the kid on the paddleboard and you understand that he's aiming for the village and he's returning to the village after a trip on the ocean. This one is much nicer as a single, but it's really as a panorama that uh, it makes sense and you get the benefits. And I think it's a, it's a cool way in photography to, to use this wide frame to tell simple stories. Another frame that uh, you could cut in half nicely, you have the path in the middle, which um, which like locates where the photographer is standing and explains that I'm on a walk. And here on the left hand side, you have this uh, pirate ship in a mountainous landscape. So if you imagine that you're missing the right half of the picture, you don't have the ocean in that picture. So this could be in the Swiss Alps. So then the right side of the picture completes the story and lets you know that this is actually sitting just a few meters away from the waterline. Um, here let's uh, remember fondly uh, my uh, Linhof Technorama camera that I sold about a year before I got this uh, horseman because the, this is a very straightforward camera where the lens is sitting in front of the film. The Linhof is built a bit differently. The lens is not sitting in the center of the film window. Um, there is a, the equivalent of a 6mm rise, if I remember right, which means that you're always shooting with a little bit of rise with the Linhof. It means that for a scene like that, uh, you can shoot straight ahead and capture that composition with uh, straight verticals. But with the Horseman, if you shoot straight ahead, you capture a lot of uh, foreground. And you can't look up to eliminate the foreground because then you lose all the converging lines. So the the easy solution, of course, is to crop, which I did. But uh, with the lean half, I could have walked a few steps further and I would have gotten that composition while looking straight ahead. Because of those six millimeter of shift on the lean half, the horizon, if you're shooting straight ahead of you, the horizon is never in the middle. Whereas with the horseman, if you're shooting straight ahead of you, the horizon lens, of course, bang in the middle of the frame. So that's one way I missed the lean half. Uh, one difference though, where the horseman is doing much better is that if you look at the, the way you load the film, your, uh, your roll goes here and the receiving roll goes there, which means that on, this, on the front of the back, you only have the six by 12 image. There is no extra bulk and extra width on the lean half. The rolls sit here and here, which makes the whole camera 10 centimeter wider because it gets five centimeter wider on each side. The horseman probably is a bit uh, deeper than the lean half because it has to have room for the rolls in the back, but that doesn't matter that much. It's still very comfortable to handhold. 
whereas the extra width of the lean half, lean half is really an inconvenience when you carry it around, uh, on your uh, chest and it's as wide as you or when you're trying to fit it in a photo bag you need a very long photo bag so i think the form factor of the horseman to be a handheld camera is much nicer uh, let's complete this uh, comparison i don't think the viewfinders uh, i don't think there's a clear winner both viewfinders are very clear and very bright and very nice uh, interesting difference is that um, on the lean half camera, uh, the bubble level that you can see in the finder is uh, to correct your pitch if you're looking up and down. So they expect that you're capable of holding horizontal by yourself. Uh, on the horseman camera, the level that you see in the viewfinder corrects for your horizontal level. Uh, and then it's up to you to not be tilting forward or backwards. So two different approaches. Um, if I had to choose, uh, I guess I find the horseman one more helpful because um, if uh, if I'm horizontal and I confirm with the level, then I can shoot. And if my uh, if I'm tilted forward or backward slightly, I can always correct that in Photoshop if I want to. Uh, whereas if I if my horizontal alignment is not level, then I will have to crop to get back to level, and I will lose much more image uh, real estate. So, not a big difference, but uh, I kind of prefer the horseman on that. Uh, on both cameras, you can take the viewfinder off, so there's they're both like easy to pack away. But like I said, again, the horseman takes less width, so it, it fits in more bags. Uh, it's a very postcardy postcard picture of the Lofoten. Uh, not really that interesting. If the light had been better, but the sun was in and out of clouds all day and. I didn't feel like this composition was worth me staying 10 minutes for the sun to come out again. And seeing it now, I have no regrets. I don't think uh, better light would have saved it. And here is one where I did wait for the sun to do its thing. And uh, I really like the rendering of this lens. It's a wide scene, but it feels three dimensional. Of course, it helps that there are elements in the picture that go all the way to the very distant background. Uh, this is shot with the center filter I was telling you about that compensates by uh, darkening the center by one and a half spots. And you can see if you follow the, the sky at the top of the frame that the density of the sky is the same uh, from the center of the frame to the corners. This is the kind of scene that you see everywhere in Lofoten uh, and it's really tricky to shoot on film because you can never really get the clouds to be a neutral color. More loneliness from the Great North. Um, I think this is shot wide open and you can see that at f4.5 and 65 millimeters, you can't really uh, blur the backgrounds out that much uh, unless you are confident that you can guesstimate the focusing distance uh, at short distances. Um, me, when I use this camera to be safe, I stay at distances of uh, roughly one and a half meter or more because I don't really trust myself to guess uh, what one meter is compared to one meter ten. And the aperture scale on the lens, uh, on the ring, really tells you uh, if you're uh, making a risky bargain or not. Um, if you see that at your chosen aperture, your uh, depth of field is going to be one meter to three meter, then you're very safe with something that is probably at two meter from you. But if you see that your uh, depth of field is going to be 90 centimeter to 110, uh, are you really confident you can guess that range that precisely? Uh, I do have a laser uh, pointer that I uh, brought on this trip, but I don't think I actually ever used it. I was just more comfortable staying in the range of apertures and focusing distances where I was confident I could nail the focus. Uh, you get six pictures a roll with this camera uh, and if you use a lab to develop your color film for example it gets really expensive really quick so you really don't want to get a blurry picture because you uh, pushed too hard or took too much risk with your apertures and focusing distances uh, when you think to yourself that every click on this camera is probably a beer you could have bought uh, at the end of your shooting day instead 
And then I did some uh, reportage style work in a little uh, town called Unstadt. So you can see I even did portraits with the camera. Uh, we can take a second to uh, break this image down. Here you can see that, uh, so I met the guy inside the surf shop and he saw my camera and came to talk to me. Uh, at first uh, glance, he thought this was a small camera in uh, underwater housing. And I guess this is kind of what it looks like. But then I explained to him what this actually was and he is actually a photo school graduate, this guy, so he understood what I was talking about. Uh, and then I asked if I could take his portrait. Of course, I had to get out of the surf shop because even with Delta 3200 at uh, 1000 ISO, you don't have enough light with this camera to shoot inside indoors, especially not on a cloudy day like this one. Uh, but this guy was at work, so I couldn't use a lot of his time. So this is what I did right outside the shop. But you can see that uh, I used this uh, horizontal uh, layout of information that I talked about. Everything in this frame uh, reads horizontally. In the foreground, you have a uh, stool, 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 guy, stool, stool. Um, in the middle part of the frame, uh, from the right to the left, you have the coffee urn, the flower pot, the flower pot, the guy. And in the upper part of the frame, from left to right, you have the window, the guy, the window. So everything in this frame reads horizontally. There's nothing that makes you go up and down, up and down, uh, unless you want to follow his arms, but they don't really lead you anywhere. So that's a quick tip if you have to make a two minute portrait of someone on a very wide format camera is uh, put as many horizontal leading lines in there and as many as much horizontal rhythm and elements as you can cheers well so this is a testament to how hand holdable this camera is is that i actually took it into the ocean um, <clears throat> This is me in very cold water wearing a surfing suit because you cannot last very long in that water without one. Uh, and doing my best to put the camera over my head and not let it get wet uh, every time a wave hit me. But I really wanted to get uh, some action pictures of surfers, which was a terrible idea. And in the end, did not even really happen. But uh, I was out there and I tried. And that's not something I could have done with a 4x5 view camera, for example. So there is a place and a time for these cameras. They will go where no other similar camera will go. This is the closest I got to a surfing action shot and it's pretty catastrophic. The focus is not really where it should be. And it's the very end of the wave. It's not really an action shot anymore. Uh, here's another picture. This is a handheld. Uh, wide open i even took the center filter off the lens because uh i wasn't getting enough light anymore at this point of the day to hand hold um so to get the fastest speed i, pos speed I possibly could i had to take the filter off and here you can see that on cover film the vignetting is very visible so like i said this is wide open no filter probably at 1 30th of a second and uh it's full of detail you can still print that thing huge uh, which is the whole point about this camera. I could be using a Hasselblad x -Pan or simply my Leica and cropping. Uh, you go to medium format because you want tons of detail and you want to be able to print uh, wall size. Here's a bit of a reportage action shot again that shows that you can totally handhold this camera, focus on the fly. Uh, at this point I had been using the camera uh, all day for three days in a row so I was uh, I was really feeling it and I was capable of catching a shot like that on the fly. Then I did a bit more humans and uh, report our style pictures and uh, people are intrigued with the camera. It's, it's easy to take pictures of people with this camera. You walk up to them, you look like an idiot with this giant thing hanging around your neck and uh, everyone said yes. Or maybe they were just having a great day. But everything worked together to help me take pictures of people. And this will be our last picture today. Uh, you can see, if nothing else, that the lens is very resistant to flare, that it still has a ton of contrast, even though the sun is in the frame and pointed straight at us. Uh, it's a lovely lens. It draws uh, very well. And this is a picture of my son and my girlfriend that I would be happy to print and hang if we had any room on our walls. Okay, so in conclusion, um, I paid uh, two and a half thousand dollars for this camera. 
which in today's market is the price of a Leica M6 in good condition. So I am kind of amazed at how good the deal that was. Uh, these cameras are pretty rare, but they do come up for sale. And uh, I'm having a blast. I don't see myself selling mine anytime soon. Uh, like I said, um, when a tripod is possible, I would still rather use my 4x5 camera and I have a Nikon 75mm I can use on that and then crop to whichever ratio I want. But uh, when I'm trying to do something handheld and I want this weird panorama format either to fit a print size that I have in mind or just to bring a, an extra element of originality to my work, um, this is the ticket. I forgot where this sentence was going. Uh, thank you for tuning in. I will talk to you soon about another topic. Uh, cheers.